Wasn't that lovely? Um, given his commitment to Zen, it is perhaps not surprising that Gaitonde should have a solo exhibition in 1965, so the same year, at the Willard Gallery, a simpatico showcase for his canvases and aesthetic philosophy. <clears throat> Renowned art dealer Marion Willard was interested in East Asian philosophies and represented like-minded American artists such as Mark Toby and Morris Graves, two of the four, oh, sorry, two of the mystic four of the Northwest School. Toby studied East, East Asian calligraphy and Zen meditation and converted to the Baha'i faith, all of which inspired his white writing or light on dark paintings. Um, and I'd like to also mention on, on a biographical note that when Gaitonde finished his Rockefeller grant in New York in 1965, um, he visited Zen monasteries in Tokyo and in Kyoto before coming back to India. Morris Graves, who befriended Toby in the late 1930s and was a student of Zen and Vedant, numbered amongst his coterie of friends pioneers like Ananda Kumaraswamy and Duncan Phillips. Kumaraswamy wrote the preface to the catalog accompanying his exhibition at the Willard Gallery in 1947. During a trip to India in 1963, so just two years before this, Graves visited Gaitonde's studio at the Bhulabai Memorial Institute in Bombay with Pupul Jaikar and subsequently sent a letter to Willard and her husband Dan Johnson urging them to exhibit his work in New York. He states, and I quote, he is an abstract painter with something unspeakably beautiful and clean added. They are the most beautiful landscapes of the mind, plus light, and composed with great simplicity. You too will be awed by him. Um, and I'd like to just mention, it's a very small detail, but this is the fun of curating, that Miani Johnson is Marion Willard's daughter. Um, so a lot of the collection that was put together for the Willard Gallery by her parents in the 60s um, are now with her. And she lives in New York. Uh, these are two examples of works on paper from the 60s uh, where Gaitonde used uh, the roller. Um, until last year, they were at the Humboldt Arts Council in Eureka, California, within the Morris Graves Museum of Art. Uh, but then they were put on sale, so I'm not sure where they are now. But at the time that we were putting together the catalog, six of these Gaitonde drawings belonged to the Morris Graves Museum of Art. Um, and these are two canvases. Uh, I believe there are more that Graves collected that day when he visited the studio. Um, and they were, again, uh, auctioned through Bonhams, I believe, last year. Uh, somebody will know. Um, so again, they're in collections that I'm not sure where they are, but these are, this is the connection between Gaitonde and Graves um, in the 60s. When looking at Gaitonde's opus within the wider related context of international post-war art, one can draw parallels to artists working within the contemporary school of Paris and movements such as art informel, fascism, and abstract expressionism and yet continue to define his output within the particular ethos of living and working in India, as he did throughout his lifetime. The artistic careers of Nicolas de Stahl, Adolf Gottlieb, Simone Ontai, Ad Reinhardt, and Rothko provide some formal prismatic resonances here. Uh, this is an example of one of Gottlieb's uh, burst paintings, where you see um, this kind of vacillation between color field painting and abstract expressionism. Uh, a wonderful example in the Phillips collection, one of the main collections of de Stahl's work, um, where he creates these very expressionistic surfaces uh, th with th the buildup of impasto using a palette knife. Um, this also influenced Ram Kumar, who was in Paris at the time. Simone Ontai, uh, a very interesting Hungarian artist who lived in Paris and died in Paris um, and came up with this interesting technique of folding the canvas. Um, it's called pliage in French, crumpling or folding. And through this process, there are these negative spaces that 
spontaneously and accidentally occur through this uh, pictorial field. By the time Gaitonde arrived in New York in 1964, pop art, post-painterly painting, or color field and hard, uh, hard edge abstraction, minimal art, photorealism, and conceptual art were emergent trends. Back in India, the exhibition Two Decades of American Painting, 1945 to 1965, was held at the Lalit Kala Academy in 1967. Organized by Waldo Rasmussen from the Museum of Modern Art, it featured 97 works by 35 artists, including de Kooning, Philip Guston, Jasper Johns, Pollock, Rothko, Frank Stella, Twombly, and Andy Warhol. Influential art critic Clement Greenberg attended the event. This touring exhibition, along with landmark events such as the first Triennale India, held in 1968 at the Academy, and the National Gallery of Modern Art, New Delhi, emblematized the internationalism of the capital's exhibition circuits in the 1960s and 70s, and the emphasis on transculturalism and globalism in the cultural arena in India in the early post-independence decades. Gaitonde spent months cogitating over a new work, but allowed for accidents to ultimately inform the making of his art. Never prolific, he is known to have made only a few paintings a year, perhaps four or five, given that the overall process of conceptualizing a work was a lengthy one. This emphasis on the creative process, the artist's masterful handling of color, structure, texture, and light, and his intuitive understanding of how these forces come together to alter one's perception, a testament to his unwavering commitment to his craft. Gaitonde's profound understanding of the properties and capacities of his chosen medium, painting, which constituted the sole vehicle of experience for the artist and the viewer, sets his works apart not only as deeply contemplative and refined objects, but as containers of an avid, voracious worldview, spanning the traditions of non-objective painting and Indian miniatures, Zen Buddhism, and East Asian, East Asian hanging scrolls and ink paintings. The acclaimed 15th century Japanese artist Sesho used the so, or Hatsubuko, or splashed ink, style derived from Chinese monochrome painting and associated with Zen Buddhism in his renowned work in the Tokyo National Museum collection. And here you see just a detail from that scroll. It's a much, um, it's, it's a much larger vertical hanging scroll. This hanging scroll relates to Gaitonde's canvas untitled 1970 on the right. In these examples, both artists have achieved masterful control over the variation of the wash with tonal subtleties and contrasts. In Sechu's case, in ink, and in Gaitonde's case, through thinly applied oils. There's a sense of ascendancy, and the imaginary space displays both a dynamism and stillness through the foregrounding and recession of forms. Referring to the Hatsubuku works of Sechu and his pupil Shugetsu Tokan, also from the 15th century, artist, um, Sorry, art historian Sherman Lee states, and I quote, the fundamental touchstone of this style is its immediate and convincing impact. If the painting is sensed in the Zen way, visually and intuitively, one is emptied and only calm remains. Such works are the silent dialogue between a great artist and the materials, brush, ink, and paper, that he knew best and on their own terms. And I think he could be describing Gaitonde as well. In his lifetime, Gaitonde equated the circle with silence, speech with the splitting of the circle in half, and Zen with a dot. And I'd like to just show you a few examples. This is um, perhaps the first appearance of the circle in a very early work a very rare work, um, because you don't normally have paintings of this scale from the early 60s in a, a private collection in New York. Um, and this is an example of, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, you can't see it up close, uh, of a work from 1965 in the collection of Kiran Nadar, um, 
where you see Gaitoni using the spatula or the, or the palette knife to lift off layers of, of paint, um, you know, similar to how Distal worked. Another example from the 70s of the, uh, this kind of focusing of one's attention through the use of the circle. And then a later example from the 80s. The teachings of the sage Sri Raman Maharshi considerably influenced Gaitonde's worldview. His silent teachings, wherein dis disciples gleaned spiritual awakening through the non-verbal vibrations of their teacher's being, were considered as the most direct and powerful method of instruction. Maharshi maintained that in silence, one was most in contact with one's immediate surroundings and that vocal speech interrupted the constant communicative power of silence. The second source of inspiration on Gaitomde came in the persona and teachings of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, a proponent, a proponent of Advaita Vedanta on non-dualism. Philosopher and teacher J. Krishnamurti periodically lectured around India in the late 1940s through the early 1980s. In Bombay, Krishnamurti gave talks in the outdoor compound of the JJ School of Art at times. He was an important ideological force on Gaitonde, as well as artists like Prabhakar Barve. Krishnamurti stressed the importance of clearing the mind of any preconceived or predetermined thoughts, so that it frees itself of experience and of the past. This enables true creativity to swell, wherein one experiences the now and is able to look to the future. In September 1984, Gaitonde suffered several injuries, sorry, severe injuries in an auto accident in New Delhi, which left him unable to cope with making large canvases. Consequently, he turned to smaller format works on paper. His ink drawings from 1985 to 1987 form an important part of his overall oeuvre and consist of non-mimetic calligraphic and hieroglyphic markings made with spontaneous gestures and rhythmic movements. The draftsman of old returns in these works and encounters the artist who has complete control over cadence, tonality, and scale. Here, form meets non-form, presence meets absence, and movement meets stillness. These works unveil Gaitonde's understanding of the silences of Zen, as well as the dynamics of Tantra. And here's a close-up. I mean, it's just ink on paper. That's all it is. Though suffering from frequent bouts of ill health in the 1980s and 1990s, Gaitonde continued to paint until 1998. That year, he eloquently summed up a lifelong exploration of the creative process. And he says, I'm still learning about painting because I believe that the process is constant. Painting is a struggle. You have to inquire. You have to have a thinking mind. Artists need to be in contact with other professions, music, theater, books. Every painting has a seed which germinates in the next painting. A painting always exists within you, even before you actually start to paint. You just have to make yourself the perfect machine to express what is already there. I could never stop painting, but even if I do stop, I will continue to talk about it. Painting and Gaitonde are synonymous. Gaitonde died in Gurgaon, just outside Delhi, on August 10th, 2001, at the age of 76. The paintings from his last years, and this is an, uh, a suite from 1985 through 1997 in New York. The paintings from his last years sustained the great inventiveness that characterized his entire career. But here, rather than an overall effect produced by scattered forms, the artist chose instead to focus attention onto a central circle, a magnet, a centripetal point, the place of Zen. Thank you.
Um, I'd like to just take you back for fun, if I may. Andre, how do we go back? I just want to show them something. Do I just keep going back? Okay. Pretty far back. So he talks about how the seed of every painting exists in the one before. And I thought, we have to find evidence for this. Sorry, it'll just... Uh, should have mentioned it when I came up with this slide. <clears throat> but this is the conceit of the curator. Um, so in New York, we created this kind of little... Uh, antechamber within the galleries. Um, it's a very difficult space. I'm sure many of you have been. Uh, the exhibition resided across the fourth floor. Um, and the Guggenheim is a, a pretty chaotic building. Uh, on a good day, we have about three and a half thousand people roaming through. And in these fourth floor galleries, there are perhaps four different ways of entering or exiting the, the exhibition. So one sets up a chronology uh, a, a kind of art historical narrative or, or argument, but in fact it can be broken at any time because people are coming in and suddenly encounter work from the 80s or from the 50s or from the 90s, so one has to kind of let go of that control. But um, apart from this great painting that's with the Taj, um, we have these uh, two paintings that were facing one another um, from 1970 also in the Taj collection, and 1971 in the Ambani collection here in Bombay. And you literally see that he painted them one after another. Um, the forms, the textures, the colors, the intention, the motive carries from one painting to another. So here was some uh, physical evidence of the seed of every painting germinating in the one before. Um, I'll just stop it at this image, and uh, before we take questions, because this particular lecture falls within the rubric of curatorial processes. Uh, I thought I'd just share with you some of the things that we've encountered over the last five years of putting this project together. Um, Richard Armstrong, the director of the museum, uh, first visited India in March 2011, and that's when I proposed this exhibition to him as my, um, in my role at the time as associate curator of Asian art. And he had never heard of Gaitonde as um, many people in the West hadn't. And um, so I took him to TIFR and the Taj and KNMA and the Nicholson Collection. I think those were the four that we saw. Um, and basically asked him to just experience these works in person. And I think he was so bowled over by that first encounter that when we went back to New York, he asked me to put a formal proposal together. So that's really how it all started. Um, International loan exhibitions such as this one are extremely hard to put together for various reasons. Um, I've, I've received some feedback along the way about why didn't we include some of Gaitonde's early works from the late 40s when he just graduates from JJ. You know, why did we start in 1952? Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of these works which are sitting in collections in Bombay have really suffered deep losses from a conservation point of view. And one can't then detach them from this condition and, and travel them for a year and a half to Venice and New York. It would be a rather irresponsible thing to do. Um, and there are also some very major provenance issues that still exist with Gaitonde. Um, there are many fakes on the market. Things have come up for auction which are fake, uh, which are inauthentic. Um, so, you know, the works from 1948 to 1952 still have to be studied uh, very, very carefully. And um, until that scholarship is done in depth, uh, it's, a, it's a very irresponsible thing to, to share them with the public and, and have a museum, you know, certify them and authenticate them and provide them with the provenance which would then be taken for granted. Um, I also wanted to say that this exhibition is not just you know, representative of Gaitonde's practice from the 50s to the 90s, but uh, as you saw in the early Venice uh, video, it has 30 lenders. And um, part of my kind of logic of putting this together was to also represent the really important history of collecting in India. 
alongside Gaitonde's own exhibition history and his life story, you know, who were the people who were supporting him during his life?